welcome to the show. I am talking today to Greg Wiseman. You know him from so much, but I'm excited because we're going to be talking about a lot of the things you know and love him for. Uh, but most specifically, right now, over at Dynamite, there is a Kickstarter going for the Gargoyles 30th Anniversary Collection, which can, which includes some, I, I hesitate to call it lost material, but I think it kind of was for a good long time because these are reprintings of Gargoyles books, comic books, that is, that uh, came out many, many years ago that um, fell out of print and are now going to be back in the hands of readers uh, after a very long hiatus. And that's it. It's pretty exciting. So, um, yeah, Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, so I guess my first question for you, and I, I, I want to kind of keep this very casual. So if you have a tangent or an idea or a thought, just feel free to, to run with it because that's what this kind of show is. But um, with respect to returning to the material uh, with Dynamite uh, after so many years of uh, Gargoyles ending, uh, or rather, you know, unceremoniously ending, um, how easy was it for you to kind of fit back, slip back into that kind of storytelling world? Um, you know, because obviously you're revisiting, you're revisiting these characters after so many years, um, and you have to kind of pick up pretty much exactly where it left off. Well, I don't know if I had to, but I did. <laughs> That's um, true. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could have said, oh, it's 30 years later and it's crazy now. But uh... yeah, uh, it's crazy now, but it's not 30 years later. The book is <laughs> currently set in 1997, mm -hmm. which is a year after the show ended. And we did the uh, SLG comics in between around 2007-ish, um, which covered... Uh, the sort of the end of 2006 and the beginning of 2007. And we've been working our way through 2007 in the dynamite stuff. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's totally wrong. It's 1997, not 2000. Yes. <laughs> this is a 20th century setting, not a 21st century setting. True. True. Uh, um, now, do, do you consider the SLG comics to be in canon to the show and this current series running now? I do. I consider the canon to be the first, uh, the two seasons of Gargoyles. Of course. Um, and then the uh, SLG comics, we did 12 issues of Gargoyles and six issues of Gargoyles Bad Guys, um, both of which are now available through this Kickstarter. Um, in addition to the Marvel comics that were done back when the show was on the air. And then uh, the Dynamite stuff, I also consider canon. So the canon is the first two seasons of the show, the 12 issues of SLG Gargoyles, the sixth issue of SLG Bad Guys, the what will be 12 issues of Dynamite Gargoyles, six issues of Gargoyles Dark Ages from Dynamite, yep. the one Halloween special we did, and then the upcoming five issue Gargoyles Quest that launches uh, shortly, uh, as soon as... Uh, Dark Ages and and Gargoyles are done. Gargoyles Quest follows quickly on its heels. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the origins of uh, the new series and how it kind of came to be? How it was like, oh, uh, we have this license. We'd like to bring you in. Uh, you know, how did that uh, How did that all start and, and spin off into two different series? Uh, it, I mean... I don't know how Dynamite got the license, but they did. I guess they got a Disney license. They've been doing Darkwing Duck and Cruella de Vil and um, Scar and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and among the things that they got the license to do, obviously, is Gargoyles. And uh, editor Nate Cosby uh, contacted me, which I was very grateful for. Still am. <laughs> um, and uh, said, do you want to do it? I said, I absolutely want to do it. Um, and uh, we talked about what I wanted to do um, and we launched into it. And I am told that Gargoyles issue one from Dynamite is the best selling single issue that Dynamite's ever had. So that made me happy. Um, and I was glad the fans heard about it, showed up, bought it. Um, and the book's been doing really well. So they came back to me and said, Hey, we'd like to do a spinoff. Do you have any ideas for that? And I said, I've got eight ideas for that. <laughs> and, um, 
So I pitched them all eight. I don't know if literally it was eight, but it was somewhere like that. Seven, sure. eight, nine, something in that range. Um, and they chose uh, Dynamite and Disney chose Dark Ages. And so we launched that miniseries. Um, and um, it's just been rolling along since then. And it's been terrific. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I can't tell you how glad I am to be back writing these characters again. Yeah, you, uh, you know, you you have had uh, a storied history, uh, not only in animation but in comics as well, and you've had uh, your stamp on um, so many different beloved uh, franchises and characters. And I, uh, I, but I, but I, it always warms my heart to see um, a creator have such an affinity for something that you know they that they made and that uh, you know it's not like. Oh well, that was thirty years ago. Yeah, I'm a different person then. Gargoyles was an idea. It's it's you know it hatched in that in the in the in the nineties and it's uh and it had its its life. It's like no, you know these guys. I I have more stories to tell with these with these characters. I, I feel like it's uh, it's not over yet. You know. I mean, the thing for me is that gargoyles never ended. Um, yeah, and I'll give credit to that to a large extent to the fans. Um, the fan gargoyles fans are fantastic. Um, yeah. and uh, and they've kept my interests high in the project and so i in turn have been i never stopped jotting down ideas i've got these uh you know black and white composition books i've got like you know 20 of them <laughs> 30 of them um and i'm never going to run out of gargoyle stories i mean i'll quite literally die first um <laughs> that's not a a statement of determination i'm just saying there's no way i could get to them all sure um and uh so i just ha sort of happily um any chance i get to tell more stories in this universe is um one i'm grateful for yeah i love the idea that uh we're finally going to have um one could assume any fan who loves this franchise and is really uh, digging on the comics or maybe has yet to check them out. Um, thanks to the Kickstarter, they can actually have all of their gar gargoyle materials in one place at one time and just and just absorb it uh, outside of the show, of course, which they'll have to, you know, source. Well, yeah, things. I mean, this is really this Kickstarter is really for the three uh, unpublished works. Old, yeah. Old volumes. They're not unpublished. They were published. Well, out of print. Then, but... Yeah. Out of print, yeah. I mean, uh, the Marvel stuff, which I uh, personally had very little input on, but because I was making the show at the time, <laughs> um, uh, there's some great stories in there with uh, writers like uh, Marty Pasco, uh, artists like Amanda Connor, some of her early terrific work, yeah. Um, and uh, that stuff was never collected, so you'd have to go search back issue bins to find it yep. on ebay that kind of stuff goes for uh quite a lot of money oh yeah um then there's the second volume is the gargoyle so 12 issues of that um only eight of those issues i think were ever printed as individual comics and the uh, um the 12 issues uh, were printed in two digest size trades. Yeah, I, I so have not even well. full size. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've got them too, and I love them, but they're not even full size, and it doesn't yeah. do justice to the art. And um, and then Gargoyles Bad Guys is volume three, which is six issues of uh, some gorgeous uh, black and white art by uh, Corinne Charlebois and Chris Jones and. Um, those books so volume two and three we consider canon mm -hmm. um to the series and likewise with uh bad guys some of those some of the stories were never published as individual comics the trades came out again smaller size um but you know they've been out of print for over 10 years and they're extremely difficult to get and extremely expensive i mean literally like over a thousand dollars on ebay yeah and um this is a great way they're 
there for each volume there's four ways to buy them you can get them as uh soft cover trades you can get them as hard covers you can get them as signed hard covers and you can get them as um you know large size uh deluxe hard covers um and you know there are different price points obviously the soft covers cost a lot less mm -hmm. and the deluxe cost a if I'm being honest, they're very expensive, but the the point is, is that you can get what works for you. Right. And the main thing that we're really working to do right now, because we funded, we funded quite some time ago, it's um, true. within three hours of the Kickstarter hitting, we had funded, but we're trying to get the number of backers up because one of the things that's really important to me is to sort of demonstrate to Disney that gargoyles is something that they should be investing in and paying attention to. Yeah. So what I'm really hoping is that we can get the number of backers and even if a backer is just pledging a dollar, you know, not for a reward, but just to show that they give a damn about gargoyles. I really want to get that backer number way up there so that Disney doesn't regard the property as just a little tiny niche property with a intense, but tiny fan base. And I, I mean, we do have an intense but tiny fan base, but I also think we have a larger, wider fan base um, that uh, maybe isn't quite as intense, but still loves the property. And um, and so what I'm asking folks to do, in addition to pledging, is to help us spread the word. Um, you know, there are bound to be a ton of Gargoyles fans out there who don't even know that this Kickstarter exists. And um and if they knew it would matter to them and they might help us out here and so you know i'm trying to reach as many people as possible it's one of the reasons i'm here on your show today <laughs> um, but i can't reach everybody either so i really need every sort of gargoyles fan out there to make sure not just that they're doing their bit but they're helping us find the other fans out there and getting them to to uh help us all spread the word and and get that backer number uh, I'm not worried about the dollar number. We're, I mean, um, it's it's pretty high at this point. Like, I mean, you guys yeah, are. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're we're at four hundred forty eight thousand plus now. <laughs> yeah. Um, when it needed fifty thousand to fund, so I'm not worried about that monetary number. Although God knows it wouldn't hurt to bring that up too. Sure. Um, I'm worried that the backer number isn't going to impress the powers that be, and I, and that's my bigger concern. Um, yeah. So I really want to get the backer number up. So again, if people just want to, the lowest you can pledge is a dollar, but most Gargoyles fans can afford a dollar, I would think. Um, Absolutely. And and that would help us out, honestly. Yeah, it's it's tough to, uh, in this day and age, um, demonstrate the, like, the large or scale of your fan base um, because how much uh, of is behind closed doors. I mean, I can imagine... Um, it, one would love to know what uh, when Disney Plus launched, what the numbers were on rewatching of Gargoyles when it was available on streaming. I mean, it just became you know when it when Disney Plus launched, Gargoyles up there, and it was on the it was on the platform the whole damn show, and uh, including the 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 other part <laughs> that we won't talk about. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, everybody, uh, you know, wouldn't it be nice to know? how many people watched it immediately, you know, because I feel like uh, a lot of uh, maybe lapsed fans or even people who didn't consider themselves fans who just watched the show when they were kids, you know, found it, refound it, showed it to their kids and are just suddenly swept up in how, uh, you know, unexpectedly modern and uh, contemporary the show was and how rewatchable it, it, it can be. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to know those numbers. Um, that'd be great. Uh, but no, they're not telling me that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's very proprietary information and I'm not of part of that in crowd, but, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, I, I think what it still comes down to is that, uh, um, there's a lot of noise out there. Yes. I mean, there are hundreds of projects. I'm sure Kickstarter has thousands of things going on at any given moment. Yep. Um, and so it can be hard for someone, even if they are a fan of something, whether it's gargoyles or anything, yeah. to sort of know, oh, there's something going on here. Yeah. It's hard to sort of reach that critical mass of attention 
so that you know it becomes common knowledge uh i mean we've been doing the dynamite books for over a year now and and i would say that you know easily once a week if not seven times a week someone yeah. goes wait there are new gargoyles comics <laughs> I've done so much to promote these things and this is the first they're hearing of it and again it's like i'm on board is what i'm hearing which is great but sure. they just didn't know about it and yeah. um so you know that becomes uh the trick to it is it, it, it's not enough as much promotion as i try to do it's not enough for me to do it alone i need the fans to reach out to other fans i need fans to say hey have you heard of gargoyles and if someone says no say let me show you something. right you know introduce fans to it we've got new fans without a doubt in addition to old fans and older fans uh, totally. but we need you know uh, you know we can use some new fans too so you know uh <laughs> check it out with your kids uh show it to your friends um if they don't like it they don't like it but you know if they never see it we'll never know so Exactly. I know I'm a broken record on, on this subject. But, uh, <laughs> no, and I think it's it bears repeating, and uh, it, it's 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 an important um, element to to hammer home. Where it's like it, it's in in today's landscape of media consumption, it has become so compartmentalized and niched out that it's hard to get everybody who might have liked a show or might love a comic from that franchise to be in one place at one time and, yeah. uh, and, 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 you know, galvanize the, the, the movement. Um, just, uh, move, moving along a little bit, but I will, uh, we'll, 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 we'll get back to, to the Gargoyles Kickstarter in a minute. I wanted to ask because, um, it's just a, it's a unique opportunity to have this opportunity to, to, to chat because I have a, um, I have another show where I talk uh, about Spider-Man properties with a with a co-host, and we've gone through every single Spider-Man show. And the brightest part of the show was when we watched every episode of Spectacular Spider-Man. And I had to ask about that show because it, it is arguably the best animated adaptation of the the, the character um, up there with, uh, and of course, acknowledged by the, uh, the 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 animated movies that just came out. Um, did you have any idea slash, um, how did you feel about seeing spectacular Spider-Man show up in the, uh, in the Spider-Verse movie? Uh, I've talked about this before. Uh, I, if I'm being honest, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, mm. I love those two movies, both the Spider-Verse movies. I love them. So let me just state that right up front. I think they're sure. fantastic. And, um, I was thrilled that Josh Keaton got to play uh, Peter again, um, that did and does make me really, really happy. Um, but I have to admit, um, the, the big line of dialogue he has there is him trying to convince Miles that Miguel is right and that Miles needs to let his own father die. Right. And I, uh, I'm perfectly willing to believe that in a universe of infinite Spider-Men, <laughs> Spider-People, that there's a Spider-Man out there, a Peter Parker out there who would voice those sentiments. I believe that. I can yeah. buy that. But it wouldn't have been ours. Sure. Our Spider-Man from Spectacular went through some specific events in the show where he made his position on this kind of thing, obviously not the multidimensional aspect of it, but sure. his position on looking the other way and letting someone die, that he would never do that again. And so from my point of view, as the guy who um, developed and, uh, and was one of the two showrunners on that show with Vic Cook, um, our Peter, would never look the other way. Our Peter would not be the guy telling Miles, sorry, this is horrible, I know, but you gotta let your father die. He'd right. be one of the guys jumping through the portal at the end to help Miles save his father. I agree. Um, <laughs> and so I've sort of rationalized in my head um, that in an infinite 
multiverse, that there is a universe right next to our spectacular mm -hmm. Spider-Man universe where everything is very, very similar, so similar that Josh Keaton still does the voice for Spider-Man, still sounds like Josh. But there are two differences. One is that for some reason I really don't understand, uh, Captain Stacy has black hair instead of white hair. Um, yeah. <laughs> and two, uh, that this Pete has been through a different set of circumstances that were just different enough that he would buy into Miguel's program. Um, and I'm perfectly happy to say that's the one universe adjacent to our spectacular universe, but it isn't our spectacular universe. Um, and again, this is not a, some kind of weird implied criticism of the movie. I, I love the movie. I feel honored that we were included at all. Mm -hmm. Um, but it just worked out that they gave our Peter a really important line of dialogue that he would never say <laughs> <laughs> so it's one universe adjacent peter that said that is is sort of my rationalization for it that's totally fair uh i i also i i wondered about um the decision to kill off george stacy when it was kind of like well i know that the people involved in the spectacular spider-man did not uh do that you know it wasn't like that was it, I, I assume it wasn't like, well, we looked at uh, a couple of scripts for the unproduced season three, and uh, we know he was going to die anyway. So we just went ahead and yeah, made those don't exist. Point. Right, exactly. So. So, <laughs> exactly. That's what I, yeah, there is there is no uh, secret hidden season that, uh, that you know, is out there. We somewhere. had ideas for sure. Oh, sure. We, nothing got produced, script or otherwise. But um, yeah, I, I don't know how familiar they were with it. Um, my guess is is that some people involved probably saw the show and some people in pro involved probably didn't and like mm -hmm. i said you know uh it was great to be included at all uh, yeah. i just you know in my dream scenario his inclusion would have been slightly different <laughs> but um but i'm not begrudging it i mean uh those are those two movies are phenomenal phenomenal achievements i mean oh yeah I'm an animation producer and I am blown away by what they have done in those movies. The complexity, the logistics, forget the creative side of it, just the sheer logistics of, of what they've accomplished is stunning to me. Oh, and then yeah. on top of that, I think those are great stories. Um, and I'm eager to see the third one and I'm not soured on it because of this one little moment, which I, again, feel, ambiguously about you know I, there's part of me that's thrilled by it and part of me that's a little disappointed in it um and that may even be just unique to me personally because i'm sure a lot of spectacular fans and i do not begrudge this either we're just thrilled to see it yeah and loved having that moment and like i said i loved hearing josh do the voice of peter again yeah it just makes me smile i just you know wish it had We've been given different words to say. <laughs> That's totally fair. Uh, apropos of Spider-Man, I'm thrilled to see uh, you making a, a big splash on the comic scene again, uh, this time with the spectacular Spider-Men series with Humberto Ramos. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, what we can expect from this series and uh, and how excited you are to be back in the uh, back in the saddle, so to speak, with the web slinger? Um I love it. I mean, you know, Spider-Man is one of my favorite characters of all time, which anyone who's seen Spectacular is not going to be shocked to to realize. Um, I've never written Miles before, but I like that too. I mean, in other words, I've got a character I'm extremely familiar with and extremely comfortable writing, and another one that I'm not familiar, well, as. I don't make it sound like I'm unfamiliar, but not as familiar with, who I've never written before, and I like that challenge. Yeah. And um, so it's it's really great. Um, more than all of that, Umberto's art on this book is so stunning. I, I can't even begin to tell you. Um, every page, because Umberto sends the team about a page a day, give or take, and every page tells its own little story. It's just phenomenal. Um, and the acting and the movement and everything you could ask for. Um, Umberto Ramos back doing 
Spider-Man. It doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. Uh, no. I like to think my writing is contributing. Also. <laughs> but to be perfectly honest, it's worth buying this book just for the art. Um, but I think we're telling a good story. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to do, I talked to my editor, uh, Nick Lowe, about from pretty much day one, is every other time I've seen Peter and Miles together in the comics, even in the movies to some extent, Peter's acting as a mentor to Miles. And that's important and appreciated. But I also know that I've had mentors in my life and I've mentored people or at least tried to. And the goal isn't to remain in a permanent mentor protege relationship. The goal is to eventually evolve that into a friendship. I mean, it's one thing when you're 25 and you're being mentored by a 35 year old, but 30 years later, that 10 year age difference doesn't matter so yeah. much. And let's face it, at this point, Peter's been mentoring Miles for 20 years. I mean, they have an age, but still. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I wanted to, to work on evolving them into a true friendship that sort of evolves out of the mentor protege relationship, but isn't locked into that. And that's been a lot of fun for me because. Um, Miles, as the younger guy, is sort of working towards proving that, you know, he's mature and he can have an adult friend and, and so he is acting mature. And Peter, on the other hand, is going, I'm hanging out with a 16-year-old. I can let my inner 16-year-old out. <laughs> um, and the truth is when Peter was 16 and first became Spider-Man in high school, he had all these responsibilities and all this stuff. And he rarely, except when he was swinging around the city, got to be free and easy. And, you know, the tragedies have piled up since then. People he loved have died. Some of them have died multiple times. Um, right. <laughs> and um, so it's an interesting dynamic because Miles is being super mature and Peter's being a goofball. Um, right. And I'm having a great great time writing it um and again the art is knocking me out page after page after page and uh i think we're telling a really fun story and um so uh, yeah definitely uh hope people check it out if if you like spectacular spider-man the tv series i think you'll like this book i don't want to pretend it's in that universe it's not this is the main marvel universe but um but you know I have a certain interpretation of Peter and I feel like I have intimate knowledge of that character. And, and so I, I just think, you know, everyone involved is just really having a blast on it. And I think it shows in the final product. So I, yeah, I definitely hope folks will check it out. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's definitely on my poll list. My, my, uh, my media question about it has to be, um, I haven't seen you on a Spider-Man book since I want to say like 2010, and I love that, like, it sees you return to the character in the comics again. Where did you pitch to them? Did they go, hey, you know, it'd be great yeah. for this kind of book? Like, where did, where did that uh, where did that come from? Caden, uh, who's uh, the assistant editor on the book, um, had been reading the Gargoyles books that I'd done and liked them and uh, mentioned them to Nick. And Nick said, oh, yeah, Greg Weissman. And he did the TV series. Right. Um, We've got this book. So he contacted me and, uh, you know, was working really hard to convince me, you know, it's Peter, it's Miles, we've got Umberto Ramos. Uh, and I, I'm trying to get a word in edgewise to say yes. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm finally, I'm like, Nick, Nick, you had me at the word spy. Dirt. You know I mean? Uh, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, you mentioned spider. I'm like, I'm in. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, I wasn't hard to sell on this. Project. Hell no, yeah. <laughs> but the truth is, is that everything about it thrills me. I mean, I, I'm, uh, you know, Peter has his own title. Miles has his own title. So I'm not dealing with the forefront angst in both of their lives. Um, right. I'm. This is a book about two friends who decide to meet for coffee every Wednesday just to check in with each other and make sure they're okay and see how things are going and have a good time. Yeah. And so we uh, set the book at the coffee shop on the ESU campus 
um, which is Peter's alma mater on the one hand. And on the other hand, it's a school that Miles is really interested in applying to. Um, and we built a little supporting cast there of baristas and customers. Um, and I'm not pretending otherwise, you know, there's some cheers influence to this, you know, <laughs> the idea is that this is a coffee shop that Peter miles come in and everybody knows their names, you know, I mean it, and, um, this is, uh, you know, Thursday through Tuesday belong to the, the Zeb and Cody, but Wednesdays are mine, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and they get together. And of course the plan was, this isn't, we're not coming in as Spider-Man. We are coming in as Pete and Miles. We are just here to have coffee. No arachnobatics at all. Mm -hmm. And of course that lasts for about five seconds before <laughs> something goes wrong and they've got to suit up and go into action. But, uh, but that's fun too, you know, um, yeah. with great power comes great responsibility and occasionally coffee. <laughs> I, uh, I bringing it right back uh, to where we started um, with respect to the fact that we're, we're getting this Gargoyles uh, Kickstarter. We're returning to these books that have been out of print and they're going to be in the hands of the fans and the people who want them. Maybe the people who didn't know they wanted them, but now they have them. Uh, the new series uh, that has uh, we're on. I want to say we're on issue 11 of Gargoyles yeah. at this point. Uh, and... 11 of Gargoyles and issue 5 of Dark Ages. So yeah. there's one more of each. Oh my god. Uh, do you have... I mean, I guess it doesn't... It goes without saying to say you have ideas for more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, out of all of the uh, the characters that you've, you've, you've brought to this universe and out of all the like explorations that you've managed to get back to, do you have a sense of urgency where you're like, oh my God, we're actually doing it. I, I better, I better get this one idea out there as soon as possible. Or uh, is it more like, no, the story comes first. It's really important that I get to that one idea. That uh, it's really for me, the characters that come first. So the characters drive this thing for me. Um, yeah. That's been true going back to when we were doing the TV series. Um, and this is, I think on any, series you're doing whether it's television or comic books um movies might be slightly different because they're sort of initially designed as one and done you know cinematic universes aside uh yep. but if you're doing a comic book series if you're doing a television series you know it's working well when the characters are telling you what they're going to do next yes. and one character may decide they're doing this and another character may decide they're doing that and that's going to send them against each other um but I, I really uh, try really hard to respect the characters. And I know this sounds like a cliche as well, but when the book is really humming, when the property, whether it was a TV series, because this was true back in the 90s when we did the show originally, um, when it was really humming, it almost felt like uh, the Gargoyles universe existed out there and we were just tapping into it. Mm -hmm. um, and I can give you an example. It's a, got a spoiler in it. It's a 30 year old spoiler, but um, <laughs> we had this character, Owen, who was sort of a uh, major domo to David Xanatos, one of our main villains. And we knew there was some mystery about Owen. He was fascinating. We didn't quite know what his deal was and we hadn't figured it out yet, but we were going, you know, we're rolling along. Yeah. And then we uh, were working on an episode called The Mirror which was story edited by Bryn Chandler Reeves and written by Lydia C. Morano. And in the mirror, we were introducing Shakespeare's puck into the Gargoyles universe. And I am thinking about puck in my office at Disney back in the day. And suddenly I get this brainstorm and I call Lydia and Bryn up. And I'm like, Owen is Puck. And their response was, we know. We just came up with that too. And, uh, and, and I believe it. I mean, you know, in other words, it was so right. It fit every, it made everything fit together so perfectly, but it wasn't something that we had planned out in advance. We planned a lot of stuff out in advance on that show, a lot. 
But that wasn't one of the things. And it suddenly just was like, oh my God. And it made everything make so much sense. And, and it all fit together. And um, and they came up with it simultaneously to me coming up with it. And yeah. that's what I mean. It was like when things were working on, and they usually were from a writing standpoint, uh, when things were working on that show, everything just seemed to slot into place. And it felt like, well, that must be because that's what happened over the exactly. Gargoyles universe, <laughs> six or seven universes over, uh, and a little to the left. Uh, you know, we that's what happened and so that's why it's right because that's what happened and that's my feeling about these characters this is you know gargoyles is my baby it, it's the the you know that's what's going on my tombstone without a doubt <laughs> um and uh and so the sort of uh playthrough of it whether I'm writing, you know, when I'm writing these comic books, whether it's Dark Ages or Gargoyles or Quest, um, is that I'm just listening to the characters. I'm listening to what they want, what they feel they need to do next. And it always feels like it comes together. Um, and again, got a lot of notes, got a lot of comp books, you know, I've got <laughs> plans, but I try to stay loose because um, I want to stay open to what the gargoyles universe is telling me what the gargoyles characters are telling me and uh it tends to just work out and um i think the readers have found that um i mean hell i've given out various spoilers over the last 30 years because this is the 30th anniversary of gargoyles this year right. um and uh Yet I'm still able to surprise the readers because I'm getting surprised. You know, the characters say, oh, I'm turning left here. I'm like, oh, I thought you were going to go right, but you're going left. Okay, that's where we're going. And um, I'm surprised. And then the readers are surprised. And uh, and again, things just seem to fit together on this property. It's been, um, from a creative standpoint, blessed in that way. Yeah. Well, Greg, I want to thank you so much for spending the time with us to talk about just this incredible uh, opportunity for everybody. And also, of course, to shed a little bit of light on the uh, Spider-Man series, which I can't wait to read. Uh, I'm looking forward to, and I have to assume there will be, a few Shakespeare references in the Spider-Man book, uh, because uh, I, I, I know that there is always some element of Shakespeare that you would fuse into your work. Uh, it's one of those things, especially in the uh, Spectacular Spider-Man series. There's, I think, at least two, uh, one full-blown uh, Midsummer Night's Dream episode, which I, uh, one of my personal favorites. Um, so I'm looking forward like to that, that too. But <laughs> I have a feeling. But uh, but thank you so much for being here. Uh, is there a, uh, besides the the Kickstarter, which of course you can find a link to folks in the comments down below, but uh, is there like a, a website that they can go to to get all their Greg Wiseman needs? Uh, is there? Uh, I mean, you can find me on Twitter at, at uh, at Greg underscore Weissman. Um, I have a website, askgregweissman.com, but I'll be honest, I um, am taking a break from answering questions at the moment. Um, okay. I've But there is a uh, archive, all the questions I've answered, and I've been doing this for nearly 30 years. All those answers are archived and there's a search function. So if you have a question about Gargoyles, Young Justice, Spectacular Spider-Man, <laughs> any of the stuff that I've done, you can search it and the odds are good that I've already answered it. So you can go there. Um, we have the Kickstarter. There's a podcast that we do uh, hosted by Greg Bashansky and Jennifer L. Anderson that I'm a guest on where we're going through the Gargoyle series episode by episode. Uh, that's called Voices from the Eerie. So you can check that out on any podcast provider. Um, and then the other big thing that I'd recommend people checking out is at uh, Convergence over the July 4th weekend this summer, uh, convergence-con.org, uh, I think is the address, but I'm not 100% sure, um, is uh, we're celebrating the 30th uh yeah, convergence-con.org. Um, 
we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of Gargoyles at that convention. It's not the only thing happening there, but we're having a big Gargoyles party in Minneapolis over the July 4th weekend. I'll be there. Uh, the hosts of Voice from the Erie will be there, Greg and Jennifer, and we're going to do a live podcast. We're going to do a radio play. Um, Keith oh, cool. David, the voice of Goliath, will be there. Uh, Tom Adcox, the voice of Lexington, will be there. Zara Fuzzle, the voice of Sherry, will be there. And there are other guests, too. Those are the ones that are confirmed. Um, but we there'll be more than that. And there'll be other guests that have nothing to do with Gargoyles. There's a lot going on at Convergence. But I am uh, pitching it to Gargoyles fans, new and old. This is a great place to come celebrate the 30th anniversary of Gargoyles. There you have it. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody. We'll see you guys next time right here.